What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Overtime. We haven't done one of these in probably a year. I know, I know. Slacking. Um, a lot of things have been going on. I've actually had to do this video now like four or five times because the playback audio has been horrible. So hopefully I can make this video even shorter than the previous attempts. And we're going to be talking in today's video about the gossip and the myths surrounding card shows with repackers. Now, in no aspect of my saying, this probably applies to everything out there, every single show. But I can tell you, I go and set up enough of the big shows, small shows, all over. Been doing it since the, what was it, the summer of 1991. I had to think back there for a second. And believe it or not, the same things were happening back then. It just wasn't repackers. There were guys that were set up at the shows buying out tables before the people came in paying their like dollar, two dollar admissions. So nothing's really changed except for social media now. And that just shows everybody everything out there. If you guys hear any snorting in the background, it's because I do have both pugs in the office with me as I do tape this Um they kind of came in after I thought I already had the videos done a few times already. <laughs> All right, guys. So, like I said, I'm going to use my example here with the Midwest Monster and a lot of the smaller shows between Indiana, Tennessee, um, Ohio, and Kentucky. Yeah, I had to think of the four states. I want to make sure I had four there. Believe it or not, I dig out my notes from the trash can. I had to put new Copenhagen in, which I didn't use in the other video. So, if you see me spitting in a bottle, I know, disgusting habit, but hey... I'm just going to go with it now because this video may be messed up anyhow. No idea until we get through it all. Alrighty here. So, with setting up at the Midwest Monster, I know I made some comments about this in the previous video of the Midwest Monster. It was set up, got credentials 07 in the morning. Sorry, military time stuff there. By 7.32, I already had somebody come to my table wanting to buy stuff. They were somebody from Whatnot that was already set up at the card show. They wanted to pay 80-85%. I said, told them, you know, hey, for me to replace these cards at that price, all these, it's just not going to happen. That's the price that I'm usually buying as a, you know, dealer, seller at these card shows, which I knew he was doing the same. And I said, besides the fact, I also know there's people that are me coming around offering 90 to 100% on a lot of the same exact cards. Because they're going to want to use those to be their, I still call them sell sheets, but like their uh, cards that are going to highlight that repack. Like their top 10 big pulls out of the repack and stuff like that there. Gentlemen understood it and everything like that moved away. No kidding, within 30 seconds, number two comes walking around from behind me. It actually were two guys. They actually bought from me last Midwest Monster. We almost had the same type of conversation, but they understood it. Now, there is a myth, gossip, clickbait, that repackers are paying 110 to 150% on big cards. <laughs> no, they ain't. There were a couple cards... That I had priced like the last sale was fourteen eighty eight. Then it was like a fourteen fifty and a fifteen ten. I had marked a fifteen. They gave me fifteen. Take it as you will. Did they overpay or not by a couple of dollars? Sure, but also there were sales where they were like a hundred and fifty six, so we called it one fifty. So I I don't see them ever paying that. I asked a lot of the guys buying for repack, um, what not. Do they ever pay big over 100%? And they said very, very seldom. At the most they'll do is sometimes like 102%, 103% because they have to have that card. It's going to highlight the whole thing and they got to pray somebody doesn't hit it early. Uh, I'm going to grab my notes in front of me here so I don't go off tangent here. So really, I think that's just a myth or gossip that there are guys out there doing it. Are there anybody doing it? Maybe, but I have not heard of it. People I know that set up at the Dallas shows, California, Chantilly, Shippeshawana, up in New York, down Tampa, down Atlanta. Nobody's ever heard of anybody paying 110% over value on a card for a repack. A pure collector, maybe, but not for repack. Are these guys getting into shows early? That's the other myth that they're saying that the 
promoters are letting them in early to buy up from the dealers. I can tell you now, in none of the shows that I've been to, have they been allowed in early to do that. They may have purchased tables. Yes, is it unfair? Are people disgruntled because they're paying their $10, $20, $5, whatever it is to get in with general admission or VIP for a day? Yeah, it sucks. But those guys have tables and they come in early to buy. And it's up to that uh, table, the dealer, the seller. Are they going to sell at that price to them? Or are they going to wait out for the full show to see if they can get more value or more money off of their card? Double-edged sword. Who are you going to blame? The repacker or the guy doing the selling? I mean, should the guy be selling at those prices? All questions, I'm sure the comments will be flowing and please, please, as always, be nice to each other in the comments. I mean, everybody's going to disagree, but to agree type deal and all that stuff there. And I'm sure a lot of stuff I'm going to say is probably not going to make a whole lot of sense. Um, people are going to disagree with me across the board on a lot of it and everything. But it's just what I've seen, what I know and do. The biggest question is people say, Extreme, what are you buying at? 80 to 87%. And that's for cards that I don't. I can't just find at every single table. Or if I go to a 100 table show, they're not sitting at 20 of the tables. I.e. retail, base prism, base optic, base, 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 refractors. You know, now we got gold parallels. Back in the day, yeah, they're out of 10. But when now when you have 10 different types of golds, it's actually out of 100 in my opinion. Is it more rare? No, because I can get any one of those variations and say I own one of the gold cards. <laughs> Other people will di I'll disagree on to it. I just see that they're just because now you have gold, gold wave, gold lava, gold shimmer, gold fast break, gold fast break, this other type of thing. There's just so many different variants of the different colors out there that stuff's just being produced a lot more. can also tell you from talking to the repackers at the show, they agree. They're not gonna. They're not looking for that stuff. They're looking for the cards that are going to make their repack product better. Am I mad at them? No, because with them, they're driving competition and price on those better cards. All those other cards out there that you can get plentiful on, yeah, 70, 75%, that's what most dealers will buy them at because it's a risk involved. At the same time frame, these repack guys, they're going through inventory left and right. Just imagine this. This is my one tangent, I promise. If we recorded every sale out there at shows and there was some mass database, you know, I realized that card values would go down 5 10% after every big show because that's probably going to be the average, if not 20%. So when you were looking across at eBay, 130 point market movers, card ladder, blah, 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 blah. They're not getting the whole aspect of it because whatnot sales are not recorded, IG sales, card shows, and everything else out there. They're all basing it mostly off of one thing, and that is eBay. Because it's the largest place where you can buy cards off of. Grand, you still have gold and heritage. And all, well, PWCC, I think, has their own marketplace. Probstein still uses um, eBay across the board. So to me, I just use those guidelines just like the price guide. My whole thing is... I sell this $1,000 card. It's it's hard to come by. Or $500 card. Whatever price you want to put at it. How hard is it for me to replace that in my display case? And to find something that's of equal value to buy at that same price to where I can say I made $10 off the card. It's not. I can tell you now it's very, very difficult. That's why I don't do six shows in a row week after week after week again because replacing that inventory it's a killer it's a killer even with being now fully retired it's a killer because i'd have to sit there and hope i could find one collection per week driving to other states it's going to make up and make my money quick back onto it all right back to the repack that was my tangent i was allowed one all right so we've already covered the 100 over 100 percent mark onto it Unheard of. Very, very unheard of. The second part of them getting in early, they're not. They're buying tables. And just like other dealers, they walk around, they see people sit up, they want to get those early finds, steals and deals, whatever you want to call it. Again, 
You have to also look at the sellers. The sellers are the ones selling at those lower percentages across the board. These repackers are doing some of the dealers a justice by pushing up a more drive and more want, more value, more money for that card. Because eventually, so one of those guys are going to walk around like, oh, nobody's touched your table yet. And, be, you know, depending on the conversation, you'd be like, hey, I'm not letting stuff go at 80, 85% like this. And I got it. Everybody has different, you know, eBay stuff out there when they sell. Mine's 11. Somebody else might be 15. I think 15 is a general idea out there whenever they're doing it. But it's getting a hold of those cards. It's becoming the hardest. And building that rapport, like I tell people, it shows that I do have guys I routinely sell to that I, when I buy out collections, repackers, that I will sell to. Because when I buy a collection out, for the, most of the time, it's to sell all the stuff I can real quick to the repackers, get my money back, so that everything else that I value low can sit, go to Com C, wait, and that's my pure profit. A lot of times I thank them. You guys heard right off the bat, I thank Gary V. Man, he, he, he made the market go nuts. Made a lot of us who were holding big cards a lot of money out there. A lot of people are mad over it. You know, it depends on where you fell on that platform. Did you sell early? Did you sell late? Did you buy into the hype? All that other stuff out there. But there's times I'll say, hey, I'm thankful because, you know, these guys are coming to shows, whether they're big or small. Now, they're myth. People are saying, oh, they don't come to small shows. You're correct. Hip Parade is not going to come to a 50 to 100 table show to buy. A one-day show. They want the two, three, four-day shows to buy. Same with a lot of your larger repack guys. Um, at the same time frame, there's a lot that aren't name brand repackers. You know, they are full-time breakers. They might do a repack every three, four months out there. And they try to get the best deals they can to offer to their people onto it. Or they're looking to buy those raw to grade so that way their values jump up more so that they have more of, I guess you could say, an ROI, return on investment out there. But those there were the biggest myths or gossip I keep seeing out there. And people just, I don't know if it's clickbait or they just hate it because they're not doing it type deal. I mean, I'm not doing it. I, you don't see me running repacks or nothing like that there. But do I come to a card show early, hurry up, set up my stuff, then start walking around to buy before the crowd comes in? Yes, a lot of dealers do that. Like I said, it's been happening since 91. The only difference now, we labeled somebody as a repacker and they're doing it. While the other dealers are doing it, and they're not doing repacks. I, I really don't see how it's a horrible thing. Is it a horrible thing to a collector that's looking for those cards for their collection? Yes, it, it is. And a lot of times, these guys that do the repacks, they're buyers. You know, they spend a lot of money. And you might not see that you know rare card pop up again for another 10 years. Because the person invested so much money, he only hit that one card. And they're like, man, I'm just throwing this over here. It's not worth the sell. I'm not going to get my money back that I spent in all these other uh, spots in a repack. Blah, 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 blah. There, there's always going to be a double-edged sword. It's going to depend on the person that's viewing it and how it's going to affect them. For me, as a being a collector, yeah, it sucks. But at the same time frame as a collector... I also have that early access that everybody's talking about because I pay for my tables in a show. I also rely on a lot of people walking up to my tables to buy to buy from them to replace the items I sold to the repackers. One last thing I want to talk about, I was set up with two other guys, the Midwest Monster. I'm not going to, I'm not naming names or them, but they were doing the same things that I was. I mean, you would see these cards, you knew where the repackers were. One guy, I mean, he was flipping downtowns left and right. Whether he was making, tw you know, 20, 30, 40 dollars per downtown, you do that a bunch of times, it's big money. A lot of people are looking at, you know, these big gains. I look at the small games. They all add up to that one gain, big gain, and I don't have to be in a card for a big lot of money and worry about, oh, no, you know, like Wanda Franco did what, you know, <laughs> stuff like that there. Um, overall, I don't see, you know, the whole myth, gossip, drama over it. I do understand it from a collector standpoint. I do understand that if I wasn't set up at a show, I'd probably be a little frustrated, disgruntled, walking by tables that have bare spots into it. But I purposely bring more cards with me to shows to fill them blank spots up from the earlier sales 
so that it never looks like I'm really selling a whole lot. And if it does, it means I'm out. I need to go buy. You know, it, it's happened before. Don't get me wrong. Um, like I said, in closing, I don't think it's a horrible thing what they're doing. I think they're helping balance out that fight. You know, the draw for if I want to buy this card, I'm going to have to pay more than, you know, the 70, 80% that people were throwing out as we were coming out of COVID and people are like, oh, I can't make money. Cards are declining. Yeah, I'll sell them at 70, 80 percent, blah, 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 blah. Nowadays, I mean, you if you could get 80, 85 percent onto, you know, a couple cards, that's really good. Same with like collections. I don't want to hit that piece up. We'll talk about that in another video. But the way I price my stuff is different. Just like the way I sell my stuff. I don't do, okay, you pick out whatever you want. It's all at 80, 85, 87%. No, I do it by card. Because to replace each card is going to cost me a different amount. And that's just the way I am. Um, but like I said, I don't think the repackage is doing a whole, like, they're hurting everybody out there. Maybe the people that aren't hitting their repack products are getting hurt. But from a dealer standpoint, I think they're... A dealer's best friend. I hate using that um, that type of verbiage and stuff out there, but they help where the shows are at, and people are trying to come by and nickel and dime you, or actually just highway robber you on some of the cards out there. Thinking, hey, I, I want to buy this two thousand dollar card. I want to get it at fourteen, fifteen hundred. Flip it for like sixteen, seventeen. I, I, that's just my personal spec. Uh, uh, my personal, <laughs> I can't even get it to come out right now. My personal feelings onto the matter. Um, sure, everybody else is going to have a ton of comments. I'm going to go through, read them. Like I said, try to be nice to each other in the comments. Don't like kill each other over because somebody sees it a different way. It's just a different person's perspective, and I like to try and respect that across the board onto it. But other than that, I'm praying I don't have to redo this video another time and the audio actually stayed good the whole time because otherwise I'm going to get somebody to show me what the heck I did wrong on to it. All right, guys, I'm out. Catch you next one.